Dan Wickstead is an extension support specialist with the Pesticide Safety Education Program, which is a part of the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. He has tremendous expertise in understanding and helping others understand how to use pesticides as safely as possible. He's my go-to person when I have questions about um, using pesticides more safely. Um, so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let Dan get started. And we talk about uh, a recent action by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. That's the agency that regulates pesticides here in New York State that will change what homeowners can use when they're trying to control insect pests in the landscape. Uh, those changes involve neonicotinoid insecticides, called neonics for short. Uh, they've become about the most popular insecticides for farmers and homeowners alike with imidacloprid being the active ingredient in most of the neonic products being used by homeowners. And they use them to control insect pests in turf, ornamental plants, and trees. So these are the products we're gonna be talking about today. And with that, Amara, if you can put up the first poll question. Right, folks, you should be seeing a window on your screen that's asking you, do you read all the instructions on the label before you buy and use a pesticide? And your options are always, sometimes, or never. These are anonymous, so don't be afraid to uh, tell the truth here. All right, I'm going to give folks just another couple seconds to respond because I see their responses trailing off so that we can see the results here. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. It looks like about 70% of folks always, um, about 30% sometimes, and a very small percentage never. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Okay, um, well, that's it. That information is important. We'll talk about it in a bit, but you are you should read the label before you buy a product, just to make sure it's the right product and that you use it correctly. We'll talk about that in a bit. So, and this is why the standard that must be met for a pesticide product to be used in the United States before it can be sold here, is that when used according to label directions, the product will not cause unreasonable adverse effects to human health or the environment. You can see using according to label directions is a key factor. Here. Now, Keep in mind that word unreasonable, uh, as far as unreasonable adverse effects. Almost anything we do in life has some adverse effect. Driving a car produces some air pollution. Anything you buy in the store usually because of the packaging you end up throwing out, and that ends up taking up space in the landfills. So adverse effects are just part of the game of living life. Um, but determine what adverse effects from pesticides become unreasonable. The EPA and DC do what's called a risk-benefit analysis. They want to make sure that the benefits of using a pesticide outweigh the risks. Now, with neonics, the benefits are pretty obvious. They're broad-spectrum insecticides. I mean, they're effective against many pest insects that attack the plants and homeowner landscapes. They're systemic. So if you apply them to the leaves or to the roots, they don't just stay there. They're absorbed by the plant and move all the way through the plant to protected against insects wherever they might be attacking the plant. And they're persistent, so they can provide season-long pest control. But these benefits each have a downside. Uh, the fact that they're broad spectrum means that they affect bees as well. In fact, most neonics are highly toxic to bees. So that's not a good thing. Um, being systemic, they get into the nectar and pollen that bees are foraging for. And being persistent, they stay active even after we don't want them to. When their work is done, we wish they wouldn't be active anymore. And that includes the fact that they're still active within the colony. Bees will bring pollen back to the hive to help feed uh, the brood. And so the developing bee larvae get exposed to the neonics that way. So that brings up the aspect of, are these adverse effects unreasonable or not? Um, and I like to use an example of talking about unreasonable, looking at cars. Okay, I'm 63 years old. When I was a kid, uh, we used leaded gasoline. Cars got horrible mileage. Uh, there were 
no catalytic converters. So there's a lot of pollution being spewed out by cars and automakers and regulators soon realized that the amount of pollution, the adverse effect it was causing had become unreasonable. So they had to do things about it. They improved the, the uh, mileage in cars. They stopped using lighted gas, things like that. Well, the DEC can do similar things with pesticides. So they see that neonics are adversely affecting bees. They can do things like add label language um, to help protect bees, which they did. You see here a very common statement on a neonic label would be do not apply this product while bees are foraging. Do not apply this product to plants that are flowering. Only apply after all flower petals fall, have fallen off. This is an example of why it's important to read the entire label so you see this kind of information to protect bees. But in the case of neonics, it didn't seem like this was enough. So DEC, has, DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, has other options available. They can ban the products outright, or they can restrict the use to trained and certified applicators. And that's what they did. Going back to the standard of not causing unreasonable adverse effects when used according to label directions, if they restricted use just to people who had been trained, the standard might still be able to be met. And so that's what they did. Uh, effective January 1st of last year, products containing these active ingredients I showed earlier, they're labeled for foliar and or widespread outdoor use and or seed treatment have been reclassified as restricted use in New York State. That means that only certified applicators can purchase, possess, and or use or supervise the use of restricted use pesticides. Okay, this does two things. It reduces the amount of these insecticides are going to be used, and it also makes sure that the people using them are trained to know to read the label all the time and to follow the restrictions on the label to protect bees. And both of these things should reduce the exposure of bees to these products. But the impact on homeowners, I think it's, uh, is this in the way, maybe? Is my uh, bar in the way? Looks fine to me. Let me get out of there. Okay. So what this means for homeowners is that you can no longer use some of these products that I show here that are applied to turf, ornamentals, and landscape plants. And you can't even own them anymore. Some products, however, can still be used. These are ones labeled for limited directed application to trees, to tree trunks and the ground at the base of trees, shrubs, and plants. Uh, these products provide cost-effective and unique pest control for residential applications with few available alternatives. That's why they can still be used. So this product, for example, it's uh, plant spikes. They can be put uh, right in the soil in potted outdoor plants, can still be used. So how is a homeowner supposed to know what they can and can't use? Okay, you're probably not going to remember the fancy active ingredient names I gave before. Um, and once you do know what you can and can't use, what do you do then? So the first step would be to find out if you have any of these restricted use products in your possession. And to do that, you can go to this website that the DEC has, where they list all the products that were reclassified to restricted use. And here's that's a few of those products shown here with the uh, active ingredient imidacloprid. So you can look at this list and think, well, Gordon's Grub No More Granules sounds kind of familiar. So you look at that name, you look at the product number, which is the EPA registration number. It's, and then you go into where you're, wherever you're storing your pesticides. You see, yep, I have Gordon's Grub No More Granules, that EPA registration number, 2217909. Yep, that's the same number on the list on the DEC website. So you know you're not supposed to use these products anymore. Well, now what? Well, if you do have these products, the first thing is don't use them, okay? Not just because it's illegal to do it. Uh, the reason is the risk to pollinators is too high. So you wanna stop using the products to help protect pollinators. So instead you're gonna mark them 
with do not use, hold for disposal. That way, next time you go in your storage area, you don't have to remember, oh, was I supposed to use this or not? Okay, you mark it and then store them until you can properly dispose of them. And Amara, if you can put up the next poll question now, that'd be great. All right, here's our next poll, poll question. Where do you store pesticides? And you should be able to choose all that apply under the kitchen sink, in the garage or shed, in the basement, in utility or storage closet, or where children can't get them. See, folks are having lots of answers to these. I'm going to give folks just a couple more seconds before I close the poll. So if you're really dying to share your answer, you can do that. Okay, I'm going to end this poll and share the results with everyone. All right, so it looks like in the garage or shed is the most popular option. Um, many folks where children can get at them, a few other options as well. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Okay, uh, storing is important. I just recently developed a one-page fact sheet uh, you can access on our website about storing pesticides at home. Uh, it gives a lot of tips. Probably the most important are always store them in their original label containers in a cool, dry area free from temperature extremes. So actually a basement's better than a garage or a shed because in the winter they could freeze or in the summer get too hot. And very importantly, where they're inaccessible to children and pets. So again, you can download this website, uh, this uh, fact sheet from our website. So once you have them in stores and you have them labeled, uh, do not use, then what? Well, you have to get rid of them somehow. Do not dispose of them with household garbage. Okay, pesticide products, they're left over and you can't use, should never be thrown away at the household garbage. You don't, we don't want those going to landfills. Instead, you can contact your municipal or county solid and hazardous waste department and ask when and where the next household hazardous waste collection event will be held. These are free events that counties hold so that people can bring in not just pesticides, but things like paints, stains, leftover cleaners, all that kind of stuff. You wouldn't want to just throw in the household trash. Some counties like uh, Tompkins will have multiple drop-off events during the year. Uh, here's a couple other counties. These are 20, 2023 dates where they might only have one or two uh, options during the a calendar year. But just contact that department and they'll tell you when and where you can uh, bring these products in. The other thing you can do is avoid online purchases of restricted items. Online retailers aren't always paying attention to individual state pesticide regulations. Uh, Amazon, for one, has been dinged more than once by EPA for selling pesticides you're not supposed to be selling. So if you do uh, purchase pesticides online. The first thing you want to do is make sure the site is allowing you full access to the product label. So you can first make sure it's something you're going to want to buy. And then while you have that label up, you can go to this website the DEC has, where you can search for the product name and the EPA registration number, just like the example I showed before, where you're looking at those uh, Grubnamore grains. And you can tell from this website if that product is legal to use in New York State and not restricted. So it might be legal to use in, in the state, but if it's restricted, only certified applicators can buy it. So this is a very important thing to do before you buy products online. So in summary, many of the neonic insecticides that homeowners had access to recently have been reclassified restricted use to protect pollinators. So homeowners can no longer use or even have these products anymore. So what they should do is go to this website to see if they have any restricted products. Don't use them, but instead store them properly, label do not use, hold for disposal, then contact your local Falvin Hazardous Waste Department to find out what options you have for disposing of the products. And use the steps I mentioned to avoid buying restricted products online. It's very easy to do accidentally. 
So again, use that DEC website to make sure the products you're buying are okay to use. And with that, I'll take questions. I want to mention the website I had for fact sheets before. Uh, we have several other fact sheets that will be useful to homeowners. Uh, what is a pesticide? Because a lot of people think it just means insecticides, but it also means herbicides or denticides, even disinfectants. And an article on hazard versus risk. How to select a pesticide product? Because now if you can't use Gordon's Grub no more, what else can you use? That fact sheet tells me how to go to a store and find out something that we'll use. And again, the storing pesticides at home fact sheet I put up. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. You want me to stop sharing, Amara? Why don't you, uh, Dan, leave that screen up just in case people want to, if you're willing to share your email address, folks might want to um, want to uh, write it down. Um, yeah. Unless you'd like to take your screen down so you can, I, I can just read you the questions. Yeah, that's that fine. For you. Um, so um, one question I wanted to bring up that came in in the chat is someone asked about neonicotinoids coating seeds. And I, I'll ask you to address this, especially as a home gardener. Um, are, are home gardeners still allowed to buy or plant seeds that might have neonicotinoids treating on them? If the seed has been already been treated, yes. Because that the application was made to the seed. So the seed is already treated, yes. What went restricted is the pesticides. So if I wanted to treat seeds with neonicotinoids, I'd have to be certified. Uh, it's analogous to if you go to the lumber yard, you know, go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you buy treated wood to do decking or you're doing some kind of landscaping with treated wood. That wood is treated with a pesticide, but only the person applying the pesticide to the wood had to be certified. You don't need to be certified to buy the wood the tree of wood and use it. Great. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, someone is um, saying, is asking about um, if neonics are still being used on plants that they might buy at home garden centers, how is this change in rules um, benefiting pollinators if other plants are still being treated with these chemicals? Um, yeah, those plants might be treated again. They'd be treated by certified applicators uh, because these products should not be restricted use. The other thing is it's an individual plant. It's not, um, the rule was designed for products that are being applied broadly in the environment. So if you're buying an individual tree that you're planting, that's different than if you're applying it to a large area. So the, the risk is lower when you're buying plants from a nursery than if you're someone's treating an, an entire area with it. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna move on to our IPM Minute. Um, and for our IPM Minute speaker, um, we have, uh, we're happy to have uh, Anya Lehane. She is a research support specialist with the Northeast Regional Center for Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases. And today she's going to be chatting with us about how we can all help protect ourselves and our communities from ticks this spring, um, especially through the New York State Tick Blitz. So go ahead, Anya. Thanks, Amara, and thanks everybody for joining today. Um, like Amara said, I'll be talking about tick risk um, in New York State and then talk a little bit about the New York State Tick Blitz. Um, but first, I just wanted to start out with talking about what ticks are common in our state of New York. And um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the black-legged tick. This is also known as the deer tick, and it's the image at the top right of your screen here. Um, so this tick can spread Lyme disease, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, and Powassan. And then another common tick in New York is the American dog tick. This can spread Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and then we also have the lone star tick, which can spread ehrlichiosis. So I just wanted to touch on the different, uh, the risk of ticks uh, depending on the season. So in wintertime, we're less likely to get a tick bite compared to other seasons. Um, however, ticks can be active anytime the temperature is above freezing, especially if the ground is not frozen. So it's just, it's good to be mindful of, of this fact, especially on these kind of unseasonably warm winter days that we've occasionally been having. If you're out for a hike and it's above freezing, um, there might be ticks actively looking for a blood meal. 
And then as we move into spring, this is when the nymphs start to emerge. And so on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, um, you can see this picture of a thumbnail. And then on the, the top left of that thumbnail is an adult female black legged tick. And then to the right of that is a nymph. So you can see that the nymphs are a lot smaller than adults. And this is the life stage that occurs before the adult life stage. Um, so nymphs are out in the springtime and um, they're a lot harder to see when they're on you. Um, so in spring, this is when we see the most cases of Lyme disease. So how do you prevent a tick bite? Um, we recommend that when you're outdoors, keeping away from grassy wooded areas as well as leaf debris. These are well-known tick habitats. Uh, but if you like to enjoy the outdoors, I know I certainly do, um, if you garden or camp or like to hike, you can definitely still protect yourself from tick bites. We do recommend it's a good idea to wear light colored clothing. This makes it easier to spot any ticks that might be crawling on you. Um, it's also a good idea to wear long pants, long sleeves, and then tuck your pant legs into your socks. This makes it more difficult for any ticks to have access to your skin. And then you could also consider using an EPA registered repellent. And then it is a, a really good idea also to perform a tick, tick check anytime you've returned indoors after your outdoor activity. And then another good idea is um, once you return from your outdoor activity, putting those clothes that you had on outside, put those directly into the dryer for about 20 minutes on high heat. Um, this is a really effective way of killing any ticks that might have you know, hitchhiked home on your clothes. Um, ticks are really sensitive to humidity. Um, so if the humidity is low and the heat is high in your dryer, um, they'll be killed after 20 minutes. <laughs> if you do happen to get a tick bite, there are some uh, simple steps to take to remove it properly. Um, so we recommend using clean tweezers to grasp the tick as close to the skin surface as possible, and then pulling that tick upward with steady, even pressure. And then after removing the tick, it's a good idea to clean the, the bite area with soap and water or some rubbing alcohol if you have that on hand. Um, so then I did also want to briefly touch on the New York State Tick Blitz. This is a program that uh, we've been running at Cornell for the past few years in collaboration with the New York State IPM program. And this tick blitz is similar to a bio blitz, um, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, there are programs that get people out in the community and collect animals and plants in their area. Um, so the tick blitz is a similar idea, but we're just focusing on ticks. So it's a, it's a community science opportunity. It gets community members outdoors. Um, people who decide to participate get to see what types of ticks are in their area. Uh, we provide education to volunteers about ticks and the potential diseases that they can spread. And then we um, also offer training and collection, tick collection supplies for volunteers. So just a few additional details on the New York State Tick Blitz. Um, I think Amaro is going to share a link to our website, which has all this information. But um, just briefly, this year, the Tick Blitz will be really focusing on the western region of New York. Uh, so the eight counties listed below is where we'll be recruiting volunteers from. And then tick collections will occur in New York State parks or a location of the volunteers choosing. And then this takes place over a two-week period in June from the 16th to the 29th. And volunteers would just be expected to collect ticks on one, at least one day during that two week period. Um, so if this sounds of interest to you, or if you just want to learn more, you can visit our website for more information. You could also um, reach out to us at tickblitz at gmail.com, um, or you can scan this QR code that's up in the top right corner of your screen. Um, so that's all that I had in terms of slides, but happy to take any questions if there's time. Great. Thank you so much, Anya. Um, I did drop the link in the chat for that website. Um, and uh, we can, uh, is it okay if we include the email address from that last slide when we post the comments for the video? Yes, of course. Great. We can do that too. Um, I, oh, here's a question. Is Tick Blitz also connecting with 4-H educators in Western New York? Yeah, unfortunately, um, we don't enroll um, people under 18, so we're not really targeting youth. We also don't want to put youth kind of at additional risk of going out into tick habitat. 
Um, so we're really focusing on adults. A large portion of our volunteer basis in the past has been master gardeners, which has been a great um, source of volunteers in the past and probably will be in the future as well. Great. Well, thank you again to our speakers for sharing this great information. Thank you to everyone who attended today. Remember that we will be posting a recording from today's presentation on YouTube. Matt's going to drop the link in the chat just to remind you about that. It'll take us a few days to get the captioning set up, um, but that will be coming. So you can watch the video again or share it with friends. Um, also, um, if you have not already signed up for our the rest of our events for 2024, we encourage you to do that. And Matt has dropped the registration page for that in the chat as well. Thank you. Our next event on April 5th, we'll, we'll be talking about why weed identification matters and also talking about keeping rats out of your urban vegetable gardens. So don't want to miss that. Thank you all for attending today and have a great afternoon.